about how do we really do that? How do we make room for King Jesus? How do we make room in our lives, especially at this time of year? It's kind of crazy that Christmas, which is a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, becomes one of the most hectic, busy times of year. And it is so easy in the midst of all of our celebrations to lose the centerpiece of Christmas, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we've been talking about over the last four weeks, how do we really make room for Jesus and allow him to literally be that centerpiece in our heart, not just at Christmas, but every day of the year. So in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, uh, which has been our foundational scripture, Luke 2 and John chapter 4, the Bible says this of Mary. It says, And Mary brought forth her firstborn son, Jesus, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And John chapter 4 says, And then the woman of Samaria said to Jesus, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living Water. Our first point, which has kind of been the main thought for this series, is that if we only knew, right? We said if we only knew really who Jesus was, if we only knew the gift of God that He wants to bring into our lives, that we would make room for Jesus every day of our lives. And I am totally convinced of that. I'm totally convinced that we live in a world that is very skeptical and very critical and, and very analytical of a lot of different things. But I believe this with all my heart. I believe that if people could actually see Jesus, Jesus. If they could see him for who he is, if they could really understand the gift of God that he wants to bring into each and every heart and every life, I believe that people would make room for him. I believe just like the innkeeper on that first Christmas evening, if he would have known who Mary and Joseph were, if he would have understood the gift that was about to be given, he would have made room in that end, right? He would have cleared a spot, a place for Jesus the King to be born. But he didn't know, and because he didn't know, he didn't make room room. And so today we're going to kind of wrap up this series talking about really who is Jesus, who is he, and what gifts does he bring. We've talked about a couple things over the last few weeks. We said, number one, that he is the God of hope, right? We said, and he brings the gift of hope into our life. We said he's the Prince of Peace, and he brings the gift of peace into our life. Last week we talked about he is the Savior of the world, and he brings the gift of joy. Amen. Somebody glad to be alive today. Any joy-filled people in the house of the Lord today? Thank you for your joy, Lord. But today, as we kind of wrap up this series, we're going to kind of wrap up with the most significant element because it is the revelation of Jesus today that we're going to talk about that gives way for the hope, that gives way for the peace, and that gives way for the joy. So what is that next little declaration? Who is he? He is love, right? He is love. And he brings the gift of love into our life. Love is not what God does. Love is who God is. Right? He is love. Right? Love has a name. His name is Jesus. Right? Love has a name. And Jesus is love. God is love and he brings that gift of love into our life. And as we talk about the love of God today, what's exciting is it is, it is through the love of God that we experience his hope. It is through the love of God that we experience his peace. It is through the love of God that we experience his joy. If you remove the love of God from the Christmas equation, there is no hope, there is no peace, and there is no joy 
apart from God's love because it is the love of God that made everything else possible. It is the love of God that opens the doorway for us to enter in. It is the love of God that enables me and you to know who He is and experience His love and His life in a real and a powerful way. It is through His love that everything we encounter and experience in Jesus is possible. And so today as we talk about the love of God and as we celebrate Christmas, we are celebrating the pinnacle of what Christianity is about. It is about a God who loves the world, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we celebrate Christmas because God gave a gift, His Son Jesus, the love of God to love the world and to change us and transform us into the people that He's called us to be. Amen? So let's look together in 1 John chapter 4. Because in 1 John chapter 4, we get an amazing revelation of the love of God. The Bible says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Love comes from God. And anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Verse 9 says, And God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. Look at verse 10. And this is real love. You don't know what real love is? This is real love. Here we are. We're about to read it. This is what real love looks like. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. This is real love. Real love is not that we love God. Real love is that God loves us. I mean, if you think about it for just a minute, it's not hard to believe that an imperfect person could love a perfect God. Right? How many of you know we're all imperfect? It's not real hard to believe that an imperfect person could love a perfect God. But what about a perfect God loving imperfect people? The Bible says this is real love, that a perfect God who created humanity in His image with with a perfect connection to heaven, that a perfect God who created a perfect man who allowed that man to have a choice, and that man, because of his choice, made a decision to rebel against God. And for all eternity now, we have been rebelling rebelling against and becoming offensive to and fighting against God, and yet the God who is perfect loves an imperfect people. This is real love. I mean, think about it for just a minute, right? Well, it's Christmas time. We're all doing a bunch of family gatherings, and, and everybody has some family and some friends that are not always the nicest people on the planet, right? And they're selfish, and they're envious, and they're jealous, and they're bitter, and they're angry, and they're hard to get along with. And I just described your family. And my family, praise God. Right? Isn't that family? That's just the world, right? And so we all have folks like that. And, and how many of you understand? Uh, it, it's it's not it's not it's not hard to believe that a person like that could love people that love them. But what about when you love that person? What about when that bitter, angry, spiteful, callous, cold, hurtful individual that's always done you wrong and never done you right, and yet you still love them? Man, that's love. And that's what God has done. You're that angry, bitter, cruel, hurtful, spiteful relative. And God loves you. God loves you. And not only does He love you, we're going to learn that not only is God's love unconditional, God's love is sacrificial. And today as we celebrate Christmas and it's Christmas Eve, I just want to kind of pause right here. When you came in this morning, you should have received a set of sacraments. I want to go ahead and let you open those this morning. Just a quick reminder, there's a little plastic seal on the top that reveals the wafer. And then there's another seal that opens up the juice. Because this morning... As we partake of communion, what we're really partaking of is the love of God. We're partaking of God's love. God so loved the world that He gave. He gave His Son. This is real love. Look what that Scripture says. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us. And how many of you know that love's more than a feeling? 
Man, I, I love feelings. I love the warm, fuzzy feelings we get, and, and I love the, the feelings of love. But love is more than a feeling. Love is an action. Verse 9 says that God showed His love. God demonstrated His love. Romans says that God demonstrated His love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? While you were that mean, ugly, hateful, spiteful relative, God loved you. Not only did He love you, not only did He show compassion to you, not only did He show mercy to you, but He actually offered Himself as a living sacrifice. He died so that you might live. The Bible says scarcely uh, for a good man would someone die, but how rarely would it be for an evil or wicked man that someone would die. We all have people in our lives and our families, our friends, that we would die for without hesitation. And then there's some other people we'd have to think about. <laughs> Come on. You're not that holy. Come on. <laughs> there are some folks you'd let take a bullet for you. <laughs> but God loved us demonstrated His love toward us while we were still sinners, enemies of God, cursing God, resisting God, fighting God. And God so loved the world that He gave. He sent His Son Jesus, God robed in flesh, love wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, ignored by humanity but celebrated by heaven. And today we get to partake of the greatest gift, the gift of God's love. What you may not realize is that when you opened your sacrament containers this morning, you actually opened the greatest gift you're going to open this entire Christmas season. You just opened the greatest gift you will receive this Christmas season. Every other gift you receive will pale in comparison to what you just unwrapped. Because this gift represents the gift of God's love. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the love of God. God that is greater, more powerful, more surpassing than anything that we have ever known before. And we pray today your blessing upon the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctify and purify it today. And Lord, today may we receive the gift of love, the love of God that changed the world. May we receive it today with grateful hearts and thankful spirits. And Lord, as the Apostle Paul said, may the love of Christ compel us. May we share your love. May we share the sacrificial, unconditional love of God every day of our lives as we live out what you have so graciously and divinely deposited within us through your Son. So today we thank you for the body and blood of Christ, and we receive it today in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, let's partake of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads one more time. Father, again, we thank you. May our hearts be filled, and may our lives overflow with the love of your Son, Jesus. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Our ushers are going to come through and collect those sacraments from you. I want us to continue to read today out of the gospel or the uh, book of 1 John. Let me just reread verse 10 again. The Bible says this is real love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And then look at verse 18. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. King James says perfect love casts out fear. It expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. Amen. We love each other because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. Amen. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And He has given us this commandment, those who love God must also love their Christian brothers 
and sisters. So let's look at that next point on your outline. So what is God's love? And what is the gift of love that He brings? In the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, there are three words, Greek words, that are used to describe love. The first one is eros, and the next one is phileo. Eros and phileo, love. These are conditional loves. Their loves are feelings or emotions that we feel or that we show to other people based upon how they make us feel, right? Eros and phileo love are conditional love. Eros love is the word where which we get sexual love. It is intimate love. It is, it is used to describe the commitment of intimacy and love between a man and a woman in holy matrimony. It is the thing that... Uh, that causes us to be attracted to another person to such a degree that we want to spend the rest of our lives with them. Now, how many of you understand that Eros love, that sexual love, that intimate desiring love is a conditional love? It's conditional based on how the other person makes us feel. And I know it's conditional, and you know it's conditional, because we've all seen people that were married for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and all of a sudden somebody walks in and says, I don't love you anymore. What do they mean? They mean, I don't feel what I feel, what I used to feel towards you. I don't feel that desire towards you. I don't feel those affections towards you. And I'm not sure if I want to spend the rest of my life being intimate and personal with you and with you alone. And so we understand there is a conditional element to the Eros love that we walk in. Now, this is not a marriage message, and so I'm not going to go into a lot of great stuff that we could talk about, but we all understand that all kinds of love have to be cultivated and, and nurtured. And if you're going to stay passionately, intimately in love with your spouse, you're going to have to feed that thing. You're going to have to cultivate it. You're going to have to invest in that relationships because Eros love is conditional. How many of you know feelings fade? <laughs> The second kind of love is phileo love. It's, uh, it's friendship love. It's brotherly love. It's the it's love that we have for each other as friends. It's, it's the kind of love that connects us and causes us to want to hang out and, and, uh, and be buddies and go out to eat and, and just enjoy being together. How many of you understand that even as Christians, uh, we can be friendly to everybody, but even as a Christian, you don't really want to be friends with everybody? Because phileo love is conditional, Right? It's conditional based upon how another person makes you feel. So if you're around somebody and they make you feel good and they make you feel happy and they make you laugh and you enjoy their company and you walk away feeling better about yourself and who you are than you did when you first met them, then that's a person you want to be friends with, right? You want to hang out with them. And then there are other people that when you get around them, you don't feel so good and you don't feel so happy and you're thinking about how can I quickly get away <laughs> from this person. Why? Because phileo love is a conditional love. It's a love that's based on how people make you feel. And we all know this to be true also, right? There have been what you might have thought to be great, rock-solid friendships that something happened and something changed and there was a new element that was added into the environment and all of a sudden you went from being BFFs, right, best friends forever, to I'll see you later and maybe I'll bump into you at Walmart and if I don't see you it may not even matter. Right? We've all seen that happen. We've all... Why? Because... Phileo love is conditional. It's a conditional love that's based on how we feel. And that's the same thing true of marriage relationships and intimate relationships. If you're going to have lasting friendships, how many of you know you've got to invest in those things? You've got to cultivate lasting friendships. Because uh, uh, Eros love and Phileo love, they don't just continually happen. They are the result of how other people make us feel. But there's another kind of love described in the Bible, and it's the love that's used to describe the love of God, and it's used to describe the love that God actually calls us as Christians to love each other with. But it's called agape love. And agape love, as you look there on the screen, is unconditional. It is an unconditional love. And we just said it a while ago, not only is it an unconditional love, the agape love of God is a sacrificial love. It's the kind of love that lays down its life for other people. But what's amazing about the unconditional love of God, look at that statement. It is, it's the love that God shows us based upon who He is, not what we do or how we make Him feel. Right? God loves you unconditionally. Let me just say to you today, hell is full of people that God loves. 
hell is full of people that God loves. Every person in hell today is in hell, and they are fully and unconditionally loved by God. Why? Because we have this distorted idea about love. Love is not that nothing bad ever happens to you. How many of you love your family? How many of you have ever had bad things happen in your family? How many of you know the circumstances that affected your family didn't change the unconditional love that you had for your family? See, but we have this crazy distorted idea that somehow that the love of God, if God really loves me unconditionally, then nothing bad will ever happen to me. And if God really loves me unconditionally, then nothing tragic will ever come my way. But the reality is unconditional love is not about nothing bad ever happened to you. Unconditional love is about the fact that God is always there for you, that God will never leave you, that God will never abandon you, and that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how you perform, no matter how you act, no matter what you do, God still loves you you. I mean, he is an unshakable friend. He is an unshakable companion. He is someone that loves you with all of his heart because he is love. It's not what he does, it's who he is. And God loves us unconditionally based on who he is, not based on what we do. Well, Pastor Keith, aren't you afraid if you tell people that God loves them no matter what they do, they're just going to go out and live wild and crazy lives? Absolutely not. I believe the opposite is true. I believe that when you really understand how much God loves you, the love of Christ, as Paul said, compels me to live for Him. Man, I've never met anybody like Jesus. I've never met anybody that loves me like God loves me. I've never encountered the unconditional, sacrificial love like God has showed to me. You can't beat me off Him with a stick. Because He loves me, and He loves me with a love like nothing I've ever experienced before. It's the love of God, and and I believe with all my heart that what our world is looking for, desperately looking for, is the love of God. As a matter of fact, psychologists and sociologists will tell you that, you know, there's a lot of things that are necessary for life, and one of the most basic needs in every human heart is the desire to be loved. Right? We want to be loved, right? We write country songs about it all, looking for love in all our own places. We got Hollywood producing movies all over the place, right? We got books being written, selling off the, uh, selling off the racks, right? Everything about love. Everybody's looking for love. But the reality is, is there is an unconditional, sacrificial love that never changes, that never shifts, that never moves. And it is only found in one place, and that is the love of God. Amen. And the Bible says of God's love that perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. And if you're still tormented by fear, the Bible says you have not experienced or fully been perfected by the love of God. Why? Because God's love frees you. It frees you from the fear of failure. It frees you from the fear of insecurity. It frees you from the fear of, what if I mess up? What if I blow it? Let me just tell you something. You're going to mess up and you're going to blow it, so get over yourself. Embrace the love of God. Be willing and courageous enough to live a bold, courageous life of faith for God. People that live timid lives don't know the love of God. I talk to people and they say, well, I just don't want to disappoint God. I want to tell you something. You disappointed him a long time ago, so get over it. (laughs) Come on. You don't want to disappoint God. He loves you unconditionally. Right? He loves you unconditionally. God got over you a long time ago. Get over yourself. Let Him love you. Let Him affirm you. Let Him cause you to go further than you could ever go. Do more than you could ever do. Accomplish more than you could ever accomplish. Because the unconditional love of God removes the barriers of fear and insecurity and inadequacy and enables us to live a life of boldness and faith and confidence in who He is. Man, I don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Why? Because there is a perfect love. And that love compels us. It is a consistent source that never moves, never changes, and never shifts in our life. God loves you. And it's an awesome truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. The Bible says this, and it's the word, King James uses the word charity. It's the Greek word agape. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. 
Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. These three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now what's exciting about that scripture is you can take everywhere the word love is and you can put the name Jesus. You can put the name God. You can say God is. Look at this. God is patient and kind. God is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. You listen to some people talk about God and they think He's all of those things. And the reason they think He's all of those things is because they don't know Him. They don't know the love of God that casts out fear. God, look what it says, is not jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. God does not demand its own way. God is not irritable. Praise God for that one. God does not keep any record of being wrong. God does not rejoice about injustice, but God rejoices when the truth wins out. God rejoices. Love rejoices when the truth wins out. God never gives up, never loses faith. God is always hopeful. God endures through every circumstance. Three things will last for the faith, hope, and God, and the greatest of these is God. God is love. Amen. And He loves you. And that is a powerful, powerful declaration. Dr. Ray Self, many of you know Dr. Ray. He's the president and founder of ICM, which is a Bible college that we're affiliated with here at Liberty. <clears throat> and Dr. Ray is a very, uh, walks in a, a great prophetic anointing, and God uses him to prophetically minister and speak to people all over the world, literally. And Dr. Ray tells this story. He says one day, he said he was just in his quiet time. He was praying and talking to the Lord. And he said, you know what, God? He said, I give, I give people words all the time. He said, but I never get a word. I never get a prophetic word. God, I'm giving all these prophetic words. He said, Lord, I'd like a word. I'd like for you to speak to somebody else and give me a prophetic word. And the Lord just, you know, he said, Lord didn't say anything. He said, but I just kind of told God what I wanted. He said, well, later that week, he said, I went to a revival service at a church in our town. And he said, I didn't know the pastor there. I didn't know the evangelist that was preaching. And he said, I just slipped into the back row. And we were there going through the service. The guy got up and started preaching. He said, about halfway through the sermon, he said, the guy stopped. He said, he looked at me. He said, he pointed at me. And he said, sir, I've got a word from God for you. Dr. Ray said, I thought, praise God, finally, finally, finally. He said, the guy walked back there, he pointed his finger at me, and he said, God wants me to tell you, Jesus loves you. Dr. Ray said, I got so mad. <laughs> he said, I got so mad. He said, I went home and I told God, what do you mean, what, Jesus loves me? You mean that's a prophetic word? Come on, God. He said, and he'll never forget the Holy Spirit quote, quote to him just like that. And the Holy Spirit said, the greatest word any person can ever receive Hallelujah. are those words. And then the Holy Spirit said this to him. He said, if you'll ever grab the revelation of those words, it'll change your life forever. Amen. Jesus loves you unconditionally. There's nothing you can do, nothing you can say, nowhere you can do, go that can change the unconditional love of God. Now again, love is not a feeling. Love is an action. God demonstrated His love toward us. How do we know what love is? Jesus died on the cross for our sins. God sent His Son Jesus to be a sacrifice to take away our sins. The cross is a reminder of the love of God. God forever demonstrated and declared His love. You cannot measure the love of God based upon how other people treat you. Well, if God really loved me, my wife wouldn't have left me. If God really loved me, my husband wouldn't have left me. If God really loved me, my kids wouldn't be on drugs. If God really loved me, this wouldn't happen, this wouldn't happen. Think about how unfair that is. Amen. How many parents we got here in the room? Any parents in the room? Now, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but I wonder how many of us as parents have ever had our children do stuff we didn't agree with? <laughs> you ever had your kids do something you didn't agree with, and you're like, oh my gosh, why did they do it? I wish they would have done that. That was so horrible. They shouldn't have done that. Please don't ever do that again. Now, imagine what would happen if people came to you and said, you know what? Last year, your daughter said this and this and this to me, and I just want you to know you don't love me. You don't love me. If you love me, your daughter wouldn't have done that. If you love me, your son wouldn't have said that. If you love me, that wouldn't have happened to me. You'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm not my daughter. I'm not my son. I would never do that to you. I would never treat you that way. How dare you come and accuse me of not loving you based upon what one of my kids did 
to you. Think about what happens in our world, guys. How many accusations do we make against God? Well, them Christians did this, and them Christians did that, and them Christians did this, and that Christian did that, and that preacher did this, and that preacher did that, and this person did that, and they're supposed to be a Christian. God, if you really love me, that wouldn't happen. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't say that. They wouldn't act that way. How unjust, how unfair that we would judge the love of God by the actions and decisions of other people. If you want to accurately judge God's love, look at the cross. If you want to accurately judge God's love, look at the manger. God so loved the world that He gave His Son to be born in a manger, to grow as a man, live a perfect life, be crucified, rise again on the third day because He loves you. The gift of Christmas. God is love. Amen. And if we could just grab hold of that one thing, if we really knew who he was, if we really understood the gift that he came to give, you know what happened? We'd make room for him every single day. We'd make room for the love of God that casts out fear, that drives away insecurities and inadequacies and enables us and empowers us to live the life that God has called us to live. Look at that next point on your outline. I want you to see this. So how do we make room for Jesus? How do we make room for love and for the gift of love that God brings through his son? How do we make room for the king? Because here's what I want to do. I want to... I want to bring this thing home a little bit because I, many of you guys know I'm a, I'm a practical preacher. And what I mean by that is if I like to be able to preach something right now and you can apply it right now. <laughs> and if you can't apply what you hear in church on Sunday before you go home on Sunday, then probably we hadn't preached very well. So my goal is to preach practical because I believe that true spirituality has a practicality. See, a lot of times people want to get mystical, right? And they want to talk about all this little stuff out here that you really can't ever do anything with, but it's really spiritual. Right? Don't you love getting around those real spiritual Christians? And they're always up here, whoo, and it's just whoo, and I just feel, and whoo, and it's just all, and it's whoo, and it's whoo. What are you going to do with that? I'm not sure, but whoo. <laughs> if it's not applicable, it's not spiritual. That's mystical. Right? That's mystical. We don't need mystical, we need spiritual. And spiritual brings a practicality where I can begin to live out what God is calling me to. And so I asked God this question, I said, Lord, how do you minister the love of God into our lives? How do you minister that? And how do we receive love, right? Because love has got to be more than a feeling, right? We know that. Love is more than a feeling. Feelings are fickle. Feelings change. Right? It's great. Now, let me just say this. I love to feel the presence of God. And when you're in the presence of God, you feel invincible, don't you? I mean, when you are in the presence of God, it's like you are invincible. You can take on the world. You're ready to charge hell with a water pistol. Right? And we have those awesome encounters and moments with God. Maybe it's in church. Maybe it's in your quiet time. And I mean, the presence of God is thick, and you just feel His presence. But what happens when you don't feel the feeling? What happens when Monday morning comes? What happens when Wednesday night rolls around? What happens when Thursday morning hits you right between the eyes, and you don't feel what you used to feel? The praise team's not singing, the choir's not going, the preacher's not preaching, and you don't feel anything. What do you do then? See, because it is the love of God that casts out fear. Perfect love cast out fear. So I asked God the question. I said, Lord, how do you minister your love into our hearts? Yes, I know we can feel it, and I love it, and I want to feel all I can feel of it. But feelings fade. So how do I experience your love when I can't feel your love? And how does your love still impact my life when the feeling has faded away? So let me give you some scripture. We're going to explain that. Romans chapter 5 says, For we know how dearly God loves us, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. So first step is you got born again. Amen? 
And God gave you the Holy Spirit to come take up residence and live and abide on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit's job, look what it says, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. King James says He has poured out His love into our hearts. So we understand that God ministers His love through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit pours out and fills our hearts with His love. So is He talking about a feeling? Or is he talking about something that is sustainable and endurable even when you can't feel the feelings of love? How many understand that in your marriage relationship, if you only stayed married as long as you feel, felt like being married, you may not be married long? Right? Feelings are fickle. Some days you feel really glad you're married. Other days you feel really not so glad you're married. So how do we experience the love of God in a way that is real and sustainable? What does that really look like? So I said, God, how do you minister that? So he said, I minister it, number one, by the Holy Spirit. Now look at John 16. It says, and when the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own, but he will tell you what he has heard, and he will tell you about the future. And he will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. He's going to lead us and guide us in all truth. He's not going to speak on his own authority, but he's going to speak to us those things that Jesus reveals to him for us. Now look at John 17, 17. Jesus is praying for his disciples and for us, those who would believe on him through his disciples. And he says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. So I said, God, how do you minister the love of God to us? Look at that last point on your outline. When we embrace truth, when we embrace truth, we experience and receive the love of God. So this is what the Lord began to show me. He said, I minister love to you when I minister truth to you. It's the truth that sets you free. It's the truth that casts out fear. It's the truth that dispels the lies. It's the truth that undermines the schemes and the deception of the enemy and allows you to rise up with hope and peace and joy on the inside. It is the spirit of truth that gives place to the love of God in your heart so you can receive what God has for you and be sustained by His love even when you don't feel the feelings of His love. It's truth. How does he minister love? He ministers truth. He ministers truth. Because it is the truth of God that dispels the lie. It is the truth of God that sets us free. It is the truth of God that sustains us. And when I make room for truth, when I allow the truth of God, the truth of his word, what is truth? Truth is not my opinion. Truth is God's word. Thy word is truth. This is truth. And when I embrace truth, you know what happens? I experience God's love. Not a feeling. Yeah, sometimes the feelings will come. But I experience more than a feeling. I experience the sustaining grace of God that comes through the unconditional, sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. There is something divinely deposited in my heart when I make room for the truth of Scripture. His truth sets me free. His truth casts out fear. There's no torment in love. There's no torment in His truth. His truth liberates me from that. And so I begin to think about that. I begin to think about how God works by the Holy Spirit to minister truth to me and how that truth casts out fear and how that truth actually allows me to receive the love of God in my life. Think about relationships. Think about what happens when you stop walking in truth. Think about marriages. What happens when you stop being truthful? You know what dies? Your love dies. When your spouse stops being truthful with you and all of a sudden they start compromising the truth and they start speaking not truth, actually speaking lies, and they start manipulating the situation. The absence of truth diminishes your love. The absence of truth diminishes your love. As a matter of fact, when you look at people that reject truth, 
the Bible. When you look at people that reject truth, you will typically, without, without fail, find people that are devoid of love. Almost without fail. The more truth I reject, the more loveless I become. And it becomes about me, right? How many know love is unconditional and sacrificial? But when it's all about me, that's not unconditional and that's not sacrificial. That's selfish and self-centered. Think about relationships that have died. We talked about phileo love, friendships. Now, I understand not every relationship is intended to be a lifetime relationship, but I also understand that if we're not careful, the devil will come into what was intended to be a healthy relationship and pervert it and corrupt it and cause it to come to an end that shouldn't have ended. And probably all of us in this room can think about some relationships that probably shouldn't have ended, but they have ended, and here's why. Somebody rejected truth. Let me show you how it works. It works like this. So usually, why do relationships end? Well, somebody gets offended or hurt. Right? We, we, we don't leave relationships because we're perfectly happy with them. We leave relationships because somewhere along the line we got offended or hurt. So what does the truth say? The truth says, forgive others just as Christ forgave you. So what happens to a relationship when I reject that truth? That relationship can no longer survive. Because I don't want to forgive them. I want to be bitter and I want to be resentful and I want to hold a grudge. And how many of you know that if you hold on to bitterness and resentment and a grudge for too long, you're no longer going to feel the love that you had for them, and that relationship's going to die? How does God minister love? He ministers truth. And every time I embrace the truth of God's Word, I embrace the love of God, and I allow His love to make room. I make room in my heart for the love of God. And it enables me to love people unconditionally. And it enables me to love people sacrificially. Why? Because that's how God loves us. That's how God loves us. Right? 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, kind, not jealous, not boastful, not proud, not rude, doesn't demand its own way, is not irritable, keeps no record of being wronged. Keeps no record of of being wrong. Now, now, I understand relationships are crazy things, and I'm not saying you should be a doormat, and I'm not saying you should let anybody t- treat you like a piece of trash or garbage because you're valuable and you're important, and not every relationship is a godly relationship, and some relationships need to end. But what I am talking about today are relationships that are godly, that were intended by God, created by God, orchestrated by God, that should breathe life and energy in them. Keeps no record of being wrong. Aren't y'all glad when Jesus was talking about forgiveness, he told Peter, Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my my brother? Seven times seven. And Jesus said, no, seven times 70, 490. And how many we understand Jesus was not actually saying count 490 times. He was trying to be, uh, trying to be really clear. Peter, you just keep on forgiving him. My brother, how long should I forgive my brother? Seven times 70. Truth enables me to love. Truth enables me to love. Without truth, I won't love. Without truth, I can't receive the love of God. Without truth, I can't give the love of God. And so the Holy Spirit ministers love by ministering the truth of God's Word. And when I embrace truth, I make room for and receive and experience the love of God in my life. And God's love is transformational. And it's astounding. And it's free. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? It's free. I want us just to bow our heads today. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Keith, I have never experienced the love of God. Then today you need to embrace the truth of Scripture. It says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you can be saved today. Maybe you're here today and you've never really experienced the love of God. 
the unconditional sacrificial love of God that refuses to quit on you. God's hunting you down today. He, he's, he's got your number and he's not out to get you. He's out to save you. And today there's a real love. I want you to understand there's a real love. And the more you embrace the truth of who Jesus is, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. When you embrace Christ, you open the door for the love of God to begin to flow in your life. And by the Holy Spirit, His love will fill your heart. And God will then continue to minister truth to you. Why will God minister truth to me? Because God wants to make room in my heart for His love. So if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Keith, I've never been saved. I've never truly accepted or experienced the love of God, but today I want to do that. I want to respond to truth and make room for love. I want to ask you to be really bold this morning. I want to ask you to do something courageous. Right where, you're, right where you're at, right in the seat that you're seated in, I want you just to stand to your feet right now and say, today, Pastor Keith, I want to accept Christ. I want to receive that gift of unconditional love the gift of eternal life. And I want Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior today. I want to embrace that truth and open my heart to the love of God that changes everything. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says now is the appointed time. We're here today on Christmas Eve so you can receive the greatest gift a person could ever have, and that is the gift of life and the gift of love that comes through Jesus. If you reject that truth, what you're really rejecting is the love of God. That's it. You're rejecting His love. And I believe today that in your heart of hearts, what you desire more than anything is to know a love that never changes. So if you're here this morning, I want you just to stand to your feet. We're going to get ready to pray. We're going to close this service. But if you need to accept Him right now, this is the time. Don't wait another second. Go ahead and stand up right now to your feet. Stand up right now. Jesus. Jesus, I want to accept you. It's bold, but you can do it. The love of God. Don't reject His love. Don't reject His love any longer. Let's just pray this prayer together. All of you out loud with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe the truth of Scripture. And Jesus is the truth. And I receive your truth today. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and my Savior. I open my heart and my life to you, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your love. I am yours today forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, maybe for the first time, I would love to meet you in the back in our first time guest area in the cafe. We got a special gift we'd love to give you today. If you're visiting today for the first time, <coughs> excuse me, we also have a gift we'd love to give you today. So you're welcome to join us in the back. Merry Christmas. Don't forget to get your low carb donuts on the way out. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.